Hello, hello, hello. How is everyone doing today? Another another wonderful day in the insane market environment. So hope everybody caught and bought that morning dip. You know, it lasts like five minutes, the morning dip. Uh, by the way, let's see. Today Your morning we'll get dip. to Bob in a second. I know that's what everybody's tuned in for. Go uh, we had the house price index come in at 1.6%. Consumer confidence, maybe Bob will talk about that, 107.2, forecast 107. Uh, let's see what Bob has anything else to talk about with that. Tomorrow, remember, uh, ADP, employment change, GDP, fourth quarter final. So we'll see what that, and we have some of the PCE data coming out. Maybe Bob can comment on that and anything you want to talk about with oil, because that's going to be tomorrow S&P, you see the mega cap still leading on the way up. So FOMC still about a 70%, 50 basis point hike. And clearly on the uh, gamma, we're still in positive gamma territory. Almost getting to that peak area again. Wow, that would be fascinating. So with that, with that, by the way, if you're new here, please do consider subscribing, ringing that bell, and hitting the like button. Longer term viewers do like the videos and leave some comments when you have a chance. So going to disappear me. Going to disappear <laughs> me. Oops, wrong thing. Disappear me. Bring on Bob. Disappear You're a morning. Us and bring us back. It's like Hocus Pocus. There we go. <laughs> Welcome, Bob. You're a morning dip. Um, huh? I'm a morning dip. That's what you took away. <laughs> All right, you're fired. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you bought that morning dip and I screamed out, you're a morning dip. But you, uh -huh. well, you, you see the dip. You see, look, look, look at the dip. There's the dip. Look, I see it. That was the, that's the pullback we're all waiting for. All new time highs. 3.5% from the all time highs in the S&P now. It's it's crazy. So what what what's your takeaway so far? We haven't spoken since last Thursday. Mm -hmm. Well, on the live stream, we had the the ten twos invert. Yeah, we had the ten twos invert uh, briefly. Let me tell you right now where it settled. <sighs> settled at six. So briefly inverted and then flipped around two thirty five on the two year as a settlement price and uh, 241 on a 10 year. So flipped right around pretty quickly. So the recession is over. Is it over um, already? Yeah, it's funny because the, the, the speed with which this thing is inverted has gone. I mean, it was at 21 on March 24th. Last week, Thursday, it was at 21. Mm -hmm. And then it went to negative one today, briefly went to negative one, and then flipped back around. This just reminds me of those times when people say, it's like the, the down 20% in the NASDAQ, right? It's like, everybody's looking for it. Okay, we hit it, now you can buy them. And it felt, it had that same sort of feel with the twos 10 year curve. The twos 10 year is the uh, part of the curve that everybody refers to as the recession predictor. Um, I don't remember a recession where the twos tens in where the twos tens didn't invert, but everything else did. In other words, as you see other parts of the curve invert, it generally leads to the twos tens inverting as well. It tends to be one of the last ones because it actually represents the longest duration that the Fed affects versus mortgage rate yields. So mortgage rates tend to be based off of the 10 year note. So there's a big sort of distinction between those two things. But we have the five tens at negative eight, uh, five year, 10 year. So that was as high as, uh, let's go when it was in double digits, it was 12 on the third, and now it's negative eight. We have the uh, tens thirties, which is still not even, not even really close. Is it what just happened to my, there we go. My spreadsheet just went nuts on me, which generally means I hit something wrong. You know that, Mike. Um, 12, that was at 22 on the 22nd. The um, three-month 30-year, which is basically representative of the entire curve, is 198 basis points right now. 
Um, that's actually steepened. It was 179 basis points, for example, on November 9th of last year. So that's actually steep. And that shows you the short end of the curve is moving and the long end is not moving as much. So these are all recession indicators. And as we've talked about multiple times, they generally mean one of two things. Number one, lack of confidence in the medium term for the economy in general. Or two, the Fed's actions are going to work against inflation, which essentially means the same thing. For the Fed's actions to work on inflation, you the economy has to theoretically slow. Now, that's not necessarily the case right now because not a lot of the runaway inflation we have currently is necessarily specifically because of a hot uh, economy, but a good portion of it is. And I suspect that's why we had uh, some of the run-up today with the, with the optimism in the war with Russia and Ukraine. Sorry about that. Had dogs barking in the background. I had to mute myself. Let's see who's here, though. We got William. We got, I'll see if not, we can do it next session. Davey's here, 11 green Tesla days. When are we going to get a pullback? <laughs> Might not be till April at this rate. Warren, hey, hey, options 22. Uh, hello, Bob, Mike, your two cents, please. How's market so damn strong all of a sudden 10 days in a row? No short covering. There is a lot of short covering rally, but uh, yeah, it's not is. just that. And you have the juicing of the mega caps. You have apples on a massive stock buyback program. And then you just have remembered the mega caps make up a large component. And then I'll turn it over to Bob of like the s the weighted S&P. I mean, what's Apple over 7% just Apple itself? So you have, you could almost get to 25% just playing about seven of the, the mega caps and, and to control 25% rally in the S&P. Then there is a lot of short covering uh, that's been squeezed higher, especially junk stuff. So let me turn it over to Bob and then we'll get to some more questions. Let's get his thoughts on that. Well, one of the telltale signs options 22 is I agree that it's not just short covering. It is definitely short covering. Um, there's covering of like there was a, a commentator today that said basically a lot of like option volatility insurance is cheap again because a lot of that stuff got covered. So the prices have gone down. You look at uh, the VIX and it's back down to sort of its medium term average. I think it was right around 19 today. Um, but look for look at something, for example, as of yesterday, the meme stock returns for the last 10 trading days. Okay, As of yesterday, not including today, GameStop up 143%, AMC up 116%, Kodak 67%, Tilray 64 Virgin Galactic 44 Tesla 43 I don't know if Tesla is technically a meme stock. Uh, Bed Bath & Beyond, 37%. Clover Health, 36%. Beyond Meat, 36%. BlackBerry, 29%. Um, that doesn't include uh, the metals company. Was it Bycroft, Highcroft? Um, the one that AMC bought? Yeah. Or put a bit into. So um, that, to me, tells me that it's not just shore covering, but that isn't necessarily a good thing. Like, as a matter of fact, I would argue it's a bad thing. So I'm not going to say the end of the bear market is when we get a new high, technically, if you go by the definition of it, right? So once we close down 20%, we're in a bear market, and that bear market technically ends when we get up past a new high. I mentioned we're only 3.5% in the S&P, but I don't think the S&P actually closed in bear market territory. I'm pretty sure it did not. So... Um, the bear market in the NASDAQ was the only thing, NASDAQ and Russell, and they're not out of it yet. When you say what's with the move like this, it again, in the same way that I, I talked about uh, the inversion, it inverted. Okay, great. We can buy them now. There's a, there's a huge swath of the short-term investing public that will say, okay, we hit bear market territory. That's the low. That's not what actually happens with the bear market. So it doesn't mean we won't get up to new highs. I'm not saying that. Mike and I look at the price action to decide what we, we're going to do in the markets. But uh, I hope options, you don't put too much of your trading risk into the fundamental stuff we talk about on these webcasts because Mike and I don't. Right? It's just simply what the price action tells us to do. So I can give you a ton of reasons why I think this is happening. I think the main reason 
is because the Fed transparency is now there. People still don't realize that the rate hikes are going to affect um, profitability of corporations and therefore their stock prices. I don't think people have realized that yet. They think, OK, now we know what the Fed is going to do. There's some light at the end of the tunnel as of today with Russia, Ukraine, and uh, we hit bear market. So you can just go ahead and buy them again. The buy the dip crowd is back in. And they may be back in here for a new high. They may be back in here for 5% from a new high. But there are still a ton of storm clouds. And I would just suggest to people that you take profits on things and you buy insurance when you have the ability to do so at a good price. Yep. And as I said yesterday, the best strategy of this when these bear market rallies is, you know, you, you have a method to trail out. So you keep something on. And then you trail out. And when your trailing stops hit, you wait for your next signal, whether it's long or short. That's what you do. My long-term yep. systems are still in full-blown bearish mode. What that means is I'm not long-term holding anything. I'm It's short-term tactical trading. And I, don't, I would rather miss a move at this point in these markets than try to capture every move in these markets. There's, you're never going to capture every mood. Uh, so option 22 said continue, just like the plunge protection team, which absolutely 100% exists. There has to be massive collusion by large money groups at the highest level. Uh, I think there, it's, there's a lot of stuff gets piled into at the same point. And you do get stuff like, I don't think these Reddit board squeezes come out of the blue from, uh, there's uh, too much money that positions himself and then it gets starts getting pumped on the Reddit boards and there's too much money that it's not just retail traders. Let's put it that way. And uh, maybe at some point there'll be some insight at that, but you start getting all these gamma positioned and then all of a sudden it, it riles up the retail people. So there are definitely games being played to juice things higher. And that's, that's just part of the markets we're in right now. So, yep. you know, you... Don't worry about capturing any move. Again, I'm not putting on short exposure until I get some kind of top. There's a difference between a short-term top and a shorting top to me. I don't have a good shorting signal. And I'm not looking to top tick the market. I mean, I would, I'd pay, I'd be patient enough to roll down below the rotation zone again on momentum. That's fine with me because I'm looking to take the chunk out of the middle, not try to sell the absolute top and not st stand in front of a runaway freight train. And if I miss no, it, you, you guys, huh? if you're going to be at all active, you have to get used to, again, we've talked about this before that not every move is yours. If a move is, a move is happening and you're not in it, you can't focus on, wow, I should have gotten in because the next time you do that, um, that's going to be a big, big problem. It, it's Murphy's law. It always happens. Um, just watch for your signals, watch for your process. And when you get a signal, you take it, even if your fundamental of you review disagrees with it. We can bring up the Chipotle story again if we need to. But. Uh, let's see. Wavy, hello. Let's see. Uh, let's, SPX almost up 400 points as a Fed high grades. Yep. Can you explain the concern regarding the inversion? Yes. So you think about it just from a structural point of view. Okay. Uh, I'll meet when let's talk about what these bonds are. Okay. A two year note. When the government issues a two year note, they're borrowing money for you from you for two years. Okay. Assuming you're the buyer of it. So it has an interest rate added to it. Okay. So let's say that you buy a two year note that's at 2% and you pay a hundred dollars for it. OK. At the end of the two years, what do you get? You get one hundred and two dollars. Right. It's two percent of one hundred dollars is two dollars. OK, so they they borrowed money from you. They borrowed one hundred dollars from you for two years and you got your one hundred and two dollars back. So 10 year note, if someone was going to borrow money from you for a longer period of time, you would expect a larger interest payment. Right. This common sense. So let's say, and I'm just going to use again, simple numbers, government issues a 10 year note. Okay. And you buy a hundred dollars worth that has a 5% yield on it. 
So at the end of 10 years, you get $105 back, okay? The difference between those two yields, the 2% yield and the 5% yield is the yield curve, okay? Now it's all of the different ones plotted on a graph and the curve generally has a shape from short-term to long-term goes higher, right? Longer you loan money, the more interest you want. Shorter time you own loan money, the less interest you would get. When the yield curve inverts, it means that the government now has to pay more money for a short-term loan than they do a long-term loan. Okay? So what's happening right now is 2%, I'm sorry, a two-year note is at 2%. And a 10-year note is at 1.99%. Now, what would be reasons for that? Well, one of the reasons would be you don't think the government is worth 10 years of your money. In other words, you don't think you'll get your money back in 10 years. So you're not willing to do it, right? But you're willing to do it for two years. You think that's okay. The other reason is you don't think, uh, or the overall economic reasoning is that your money won't be worth as much in 10 years. So you want a higher yield. So what's going to happen if it's a lower yield, your money is going to be worth more. In other words, inflation is going to go down. So essentially what it means is people are expecting the economy to slow down in the future, but to stay ramped up in the present or in the short term. So when the yield curve inverts, it tends to predict a recession in the future. Does that make sense? It does to me. Uh, Sashi, there will be no recession. Just follow Nancy's trades. <laughs> <laughs> she great timing on that Tesla with by her husband. Oh my God. I need mean, almost bottom ticked it to the day. It's just, it's five. She's the greatest trader of all times. It's such a disgrace. It is. It's such a disgrace. There's wavy punched in uh, 7.1% weight in the S&P 500. Today is the largest weighting we've seen of any individual company going back to 1980. Yeah. Hey, Sterling. Hey, Eric. Uh, let's see. Over the past 70 years, this has been the reliable indicator of recession in the U.S. economy is coming between the next 18 to 24 months. I think it should be sooner than that because... It'll be interesting hiking into this inflation that has to be done. Amit, or Amit, uh, has to be the best explanation I've heard after reading about it for the past couple of days. Thank you, Bob. Well, there you go. That's why you tune into this live stream <laughs> and not the other ones. Not the other live streams. No, not the other live streams. Uh, that would be crazy. Any, any thoughts on crude? So the IEF, the International Energy Forum today, it's a guy by the name of, uh, oh God, I can't remember his name. But when I try to say his name, I always say the name of the like fourth in command of the National Socialist Party in Germany during World War II. I always say Mengele, but that's not his name. His name is McConkle or something like that, but he's the head of the IEF, the International Energy Federation predicted $150 oil unless this stuff um, settles in Russia. He said we're going to lose a minimum of 1.5 million barrels a day, regardless of how it turns out, unless it ends quickly. So again, that's sort of like why there's optimism right now. Okay, it's because there's actually kind of a light at the end of the tunnel um, in terms of you know, some, what's the word? They said they'd cease fire while they're talking. Uh, Russia said they'd cease the assault on Kiev while the peace talks are going on. I'm um, sorry, I'm talking and looking for something at the same time. I found a, an MBS chart versus the S&P that I wanted to show because somebody was asking about credit. Um, but that's my, my view on crude oil is really such that um, I don't necessarily think there's any sort of rhyme nor reason to the price action of crude oil right now. I still like it from the long side more than the short side. You're talking about tiny positions in micro crude futures. 
in order to really back up a stop, you know, somewhere in maybe the $79 range. And you can only really do that with micro crude futures. You can't really do it with much else. So um, I like the long side more than the short side because not only is Russia, Ukraine a situation, but you still have rising demand and you still have a uh, supply that needs to catch up to that. So um, it's a little concerning. Uh, hey, Rich, with the funny comment, the market not going to crash. Even Will Smith slap didn't affect it. So, so uh, you got, stupid. was it staged or not? Staged or not, Bob? Oh, I, I don't know. I, I just, I can't make myself care. It's just ridiculous. I, could, I didn't even watch any second of it. I was, I just can't make myself care. I don't, uh, you guys have an amazing product. Turn it into a service. Well, thank you. Options 22. This is, unless Bob knows, I don't know the logic behind this. What's the logic to offer options now on some Thursdays and not other Thursdays, i.e. QQQ and SPY? No clue. I'd have to, again, I've never spent the time looking into why they're doing a certain what they are doing. Yeah, no clue. I, Mike, I emailed you that chart I was just looking for. I found it. I don't even remember who was asking about it. Let me see if we saw any pressure in the credit markets. You emailed it. Here it is. Yeah. What? This chart comes from somebody. Um, what is his name? It's the Bear Traps Report. Who is that, Mike? Larry something or other. I can't remember his full name. Uh, uh, you know what I'm talking about. Yep. Yeah. I just don't. I hate trying to recall things on live stream. I know. So it, it's the bear traps report. Okay. And what this shows is the sort of usual, somewhat correlated move of S Larry and McDonald. Larry McDonald. That's it. Larry McDonald. So I, can you move it a little bit uh, so that the bottom is not behind your head? I wanted all the attention focused on me. So this is the corporate mortgage backed securities ETF. All right now, I don't know where that is today. This is I got this over the weekend. Um, this basically shows you the semi-correlated move between these two things. All right, they're not tightly correlated, but they're generally correlated. There's very few spots on this chart where they're as far apart as they are right now. That's showing you mortgage-backed security stress, credit stress, that's starting to appear in the market because of the selling of this particular ETF, because of the value that's being lost in corporate mortgage-backed securities um, while the S&P goes up. That gap is near a record high since they've had this CMBS ETF. So whoever was asking me about credit market stress, um, as of Friday, it was starting to show up. Yeah, I so don't want to forget that. Something similar. Uh, let's see. Let's see. You could probably put a CMBS chart in there, I'm sure. If it's an ETF, that's the symbol, right? Yep. There it is. Is it there? So, Small I mean, rally. A spot. Awful. I mean, you could plot that. I mean, there's your, that's essentially what you were showing right there. This. Yep. This divergence versus the S and P. So overall, you've got a little bounce in it, but nothing substantial. Nothing even close to substantial. I mean, if you put up, let's see. Uh, I'll do that. I'll work on it. I'll work on that later. But that's that'll be interesting. Yeah. We could actually track that. But overall, you can see how. This, even with this market rally, has not rallied substantially versus what the S&P has done. I mean, what are right. we up in a week? This week, we're up, uh, what, point, point under, under 100 basis points <laughs> versus what the yeah. market's done? The market was up to just today, 117 basis points, the S&P. So... I want to throw something in about the question. I don't remember who asked it, Mike, but somebody said, what's with this rally in the equity? What was the very first question? Was it options 22, options I think? 22, this one. Yeah. So keep something in mind as you watch the market go up. And as you think about the original concern where the market was selling off was what was the Fed is going, what's the Fed going to do, right? 
And there's a lot of people talking about the Fed doing multiple 50 basis point rate hikes. What if they don't? It's pretty bullish, you would think, right? Also, you got to compare it to whether they're actually, they have tight monetary policy right now or easy monetary policy. Fed funds rates at 25 basis points, okay? Real Fed funds rate, you take core PCE, which is at 4.7%, is the lowest level since 1975. QE ended three weeks ago, okay? The balance sheet is still up 20% year over year in terms of the assets the Fed's holding, okay? M2, money growth, is up 11% year over year and financial conditions still at prior cycle ultra low levels. That's from Cameron Dawson, who's chief market strategist at Field Point Private. If you guys don't follow her on uh, Twitter, you should follow her. She puts out a lot of good information, Cameron Dawson. The Fed is still in a very easy uh, monetary policy stance. So if all of a sudden they don't do 50 at the next meeting, 50 at the next three meeting, 925 basis point rate hikes, then this stock move was the correct move, right? So it seems to me like people are betting that they won't. I actually had someone say to me today on Twitter when I commented about inflation and what the Fed was going to do against it, somebody said, do you really think the Fed's actually going to do all these rate hikes? That's what's behind the buy. Most people don't. I'm not saying I do or don't. I don't really care. But that's what's behind the rally fundamentally. Uh, let's see. When do we get back to the tipping point where yields start hurting tech again? At one point, it was around 1.76 on the 10 year. And now we're at 2.4. Say that again. I'm sorry. I looked what, away for a second. When do we get back to the tipping point where yields start hurting tech again? At one point, it was around 1.76. That was forecast when we got around 1.76. You know, tech started selling off and now we're at 2.4 and techs are in their major oh. rally. I said that it was around two and a half percent when we got to 1.75, but now I'm going to say it's three with an inverted yield curve. You're moving. I'm going to be just like the analysts at Goldman and Morgan and move it as it goes higher. You're moving the bar there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's Sashi in 1999. The market after the initial correction went up 20 days in a row and then plummeted up and down. I told you. I said this. Like, what? couple weeks ago that this started to remind me of the price action from 2000 with the massive rally back what a 45 percent rally in the 2000 bear market there were tons i mean i've gone over that s p chart on that weekly basis where it almost got to new highs again before tipping over and the nasdaq mm -hmm. stalled out at the 62 and a half percent on a closing basis so it's again, I'm going to tell you that it's tactical trading for me. There's no long term. It, it's renting a position. A, a lot of these positions are rentable. They're not there. It's uh, it's not something I want to be in necessarily long term, but it's playable to the upside with a trailing stop. And when it's stopped out, it's not like I have to rush back in on anything. I can sit on man, especially if they're getting major sell signals again. Then it's, oh, I'm glad I'm out of that. Next. The problem is everybody's now trying to call, everybody who thinks it's in a bear market is now trying to call every top. And every time they get short, we got one red, you know, it's, oh, it's going up again. I got to cover. I got to cover. I got to cover. Whereas, you know, we're even on the daily, we had some potential divergences that are blown out now. It closed above the 62 and a half. Could we, could we see 4,700? Yeah, we could. We could probably see it by Friday at this rate. Uh, does that change anything? No, it doesn't. It's do you, people thinking they have to capture every move and be in every trade, you know, and again, I'd rather I put in that article on the discord server with just valuations. And I completely agree. And a lot of people, the valuations are still absurd. They'll, I'd rather be on the safe side in the markets now than the risky side. And this is just rewarded all, every one of the, by the, everybody I talked to over the last two weeks. See, you're wrong. You're wrong. It was by the dip. You're missing out. Well, I didn't say don't have a trade on. I talked about here's the rally. Here's what you focus on. But it's not, 
it's mm-hmm. not we're not at new highs yet. And even if we eked out a new high and then rolled over again, it's everybody who said I sold the top, we're in the bear market. Now they're like, no, I didn't. We're back. <laughs> Since you uh said rent it, Mike, put up the link I just sent you. Put the image up. In email? Yeah, I just emailed it to you. Is it easier if I text you these things when the time comes? Bob, uh, oh, this? Just open that link up and put the screen up. Hold on. (laughs) One second. Getting everybody excited. Hold on. Let me see if we can do it now. Actually, what? Let me do this. Oh, yeah, it's probably easier sometimes if you text it to me. Hold on, let me see. You want me to text you that? No, I got. I just had to convert it to. There you go. There we go. It's on the screen. Out soon. <laughs> out soon. I thought it was out. <laughs> It's not being sold anywhere. I mean, it's finished. You notice how we do? So. We don't even promote the stuff we have. I know. <laughs> we wrote a book. We we, it's just they just got the names in the wrong order. But other than that, it's a great book. <laughs> <laughs> do we have any physical copies? We have no physical copies yet. So we should probably do that. Mike, you can send that to anyone in these things you want to. I don't care. So, uh, I got to charge them like a dollar or something for my time. No, it's, but it, it's it's renting stocks. It's not again. There'll be there's a time, and I think this Friday I'm going to do a classroom session on it after mm-hmm. the market hours, talking about the core positions, renting a position versus trading a position. There's a, for example, I don't want to have a lot of core positions right now. I want to have a lot of trades when we right. eventually bottom out. And there was a bunch of long-term sell signals that re-trigger. That's where I want to have the core position that I just sit on and then trade around it. Until that happens, I don't care about missing something. Really. Yeah. it's it, We have too many people in the mindset, especially recently, because the market's been on a tear since a lot of people became traders or investors, that they think they're going to capture every move, every dip, every this, and this is natural market environment. Because they haven't been around through the tough ones yet. Yep. And that's where they blow them up, blow themselves up. Uh, buy insurance when you can, not when you have to. Love that. Let's see. If the market thinks the Fed will not raise a few 25 to 50 cent, uh, basis points, then the Fed is in a great spot. They could do a shock and all raise some uh, ra- raise as someone needs to take this 8 to 9 inflation seriously. I mean, this I think is that the market getting... is, yeah, I think the Fed is taking it seriously and the market's underestimating what they're going to do this time. I could be wrong, but that's what I think is. I think the market's definitely underestimating what they're actually going to do. And by that, I mean the retail market. When you talk to a lot of professionals, they're actually mostly on the sidelines. I mean, you just heard Mike say, you know, it's all trades for him right now. That I'm hearing a lot of that. I mean, we had a request from Meta. I know, William, you put this in. I mean, is this something I want to be in long term? And this, yeah. is, I, this is technically, I'm watching it as a weekly double, which triggered last week. No, or two weeks ago, sorry. This is rent-a-trade. Mm-hmm. All right, rent-a-trade for a little rally here. Why? Because it's still against the, the weekly rotation zone, and this is just a short-term bottoming pattern. Could we even go higher? Sure. But it's still rent to trade and trail now. The double will complete. And then if there's a still strong market, there could be a pullback entry. But other than that, I don't want to be in I don't want to be in meta long term. Here's your targets, by the way. It just hit the second one at 230. Next target is 23608. Uh, but it's getting to that toppy area with the flat 200 there. That's where I don't want to be in this long term. I want to be in some of these short term trailing trades. I want to be in other things long term like gold, silver, uranium. Some other the other commodities, again, once we get in good positioning, those are things I want to trade around a long term core position. Those are not things I want to rent. 
Those are right. things I want to literally, that doesn't mean I can't take trades around that core position, but that means I want to be in it for the long run. I don't want to be in meta for the long run at this point in the market. I did, I got you your Facebook, William, or meta, whatever it is. Uh, what happens when everyone realizes the Fed raising rates will not control inflation? So that's the uh, worst case scenario. There's one more part to that, Sterling, is is the economy still growing? And that's what's driving inflation. Now, in normal inflationary cycles, that is the case. The economy is still growing and pushing inflation, right? Um, that's stagflation, right? And if you've got higher rates and a, no, I'm sorry, that's not stagflation, my mistake. So that's basically hyperinflation, and that's the worst of all situations. It's actually pretty good for asset prices, but it's horrible for uh, middle and lower class individuals. So you'd likely see government get involved in that point, um, which would only push it harder. Hyperinflation is a worst case scenario. The Fed will then rocket rates up. If that were to actually happen, you might see the Fed funds rate, which has basically spent the better part of the last 20 years in the zero to one and a half percent range, you might see it at 10, 12 percent in order to control hyperinflation. So that's if the Fed is raising rates and inflation is not responding, then and the reason for that is because the economy is still strong. If the economy is not strong and the Fed is raising rates and inflation is still not responding, that's likely due to supply chain issues and those other things. That's stagflation. And that's just bad for almost every asset except real estate and gold and silver and potentially potentially Bitcoin if it hasn't been regulated out of existence. Horrible for stocks. Stagflation is bad for uh, gen the general stock market, but it's good for uh, like real estate REITs, things like that, defense, healthcare, stocks, things like that. Um, so the actual pro investors are concerned Crazy how retail can move it as much as it did. As Mike says, the market's goal is to inflict as much pain as possible. I, can I comment on that first? I have yes, two please. camps. Yes, well, we have a huge portion of retail investors who've been who've been uh, since the COVID thing, and they're still in it. But you, I have two camps of in of pro, I put them as professionals. The longer term, the older guys that have been around for the, you know, 97, 2000, 2001, 2008, 2009. Uh, those are the ones that are concerned. Those are the ones that are like, okay, this is now everybody I've talked to, and I'm talking at the professional level, not the retail level, the, the professional level who's been trading since 2010, 2011, no fear, none. The market's unstoppable. It's, this time it's different. The conditions are different. Again, I'm talking to guys. So they were cheering on today the the inversion because like now the Fed can't. The Fed can maybe get away with one more rate hike, and I'm like, then we have <laughs> inflation isn't going anywhere. Then they're like, I don't care. Well, I want I want the market go up. The, it's what I talked about yesterday. They were like, they want they're cheering on more QE already because they're like I. I'm like, well, what if inflation is running 10 or 15% a year? And they're like, I don't care if I'm making 30 to 50% in the, in the markets a year. I don't care if inflation. Well, there's no fear from the junior traders. None. They, it's been a Fed-fueled market since they've been traders. And they just want the Fed back in it. And they don't even care what PE ratios. They're like, I don't care if it's 200%. I don't care if it's 500%. It's just going to keep going. And then you have the old timers who are like, all right, we're in one of those bear market, rip your face off rallies. Nothing's changed fundamentally. It take, can take a long time to just roll over. You're by the dip crowd still in here, but we're in here. We've been through this before. We'll be through it again. And there'll be a whole nother round of traders. Like I know people who traded 2005, 2006, 2007. 2008 was their last year on Wall Street. Why? Because they were in after 
they actually got out of college after the dot com thing. So they were in high school during the dot com thing. And they got on Wall Street and it was like, okay, we can get in every risk asset. We can get in this, this, and this. Nothing matters. Every time it's different. History doesn't matter. Blah, blah, blah. And then poof, they're gone. And then you bring in the next. That's why we tend to repeat these things every so many years because you have a new round of traders who are, you know, who've been, they have no history. At least this is my perspective. They've not lived through it. And you can read a book, you can look at a chart, but to live through it versus, and be involved in the markets versus looking at a past historical chart and go, oh, that's interesting. Living through it makes you feel these emotions. It's the same thing. How, what, uh, what, uh, Wavy said a bit, it's so hard staying in cash when many names are up 50% in the last two weeks. Well, you're living through it now. Okay, you're living through what this, I'm missing out, I'm missing out, and you're seeing all the people, by the day, look, I'm up 50% in two weeks. This is amazing. These markets, you buy every dip. You, now, you'll, we don't know what's going to happen with this. Could we go to new highs? Yeah, but at some point, and Bob said, you, Bob said before, if we don't correct this time around and they start juicing the markets again, the next one's going to be, you can't postpone the inevitable forever. I think is that what you said. And Basically. one of these is going to be that, rip, like we talk about rip your face off rallies, it's going to be the beheading of the market. And everybody who bought every dip, who that's where you get all the junior traders who take on all the risk, who are piling in everything, including meme stuff. Hey, I'm up 36% in a day. The markets are back. Well, they're the ones who are, they, they're the first to go. I was watching some of the meme people on Twitter yesterday, and they just kept saying, you know, to the moon, it's going to rip. We're, uh, I can see my boathouse now. I think I mentioned that last time, but that was, was, this was a different group of people. And then today, who's holding with me? Because they started out lower. So when you have this attitude of it's either going to rip or you have to hold, right? That's when those are the people that are going to be completely out of the market when this thing happens and it will happen. So when you look at it from a perspective of what Mike's saying, you know, he's talking about the old timers. He is really talking pre 2007, 2008, because those guys saw what can actually happen and go even further back to the guys who started trading when Mike and I started trading in the 90s, who've also seen it in 2000. We've seen this before, that it happens every decade or so. And right now we're at about 12 years since the last one, 13 years. And a lot of these guys have never lived in a market where the Fed doesn't prop it up. Now, in fairness to the Fed, there hasn't been runaway inflation. I mean, I was looking at the the inflation during the Clinton administration. It averaged 2.6%. So, I mean, it's been a long time since we've had inflation that anyone thought they needed to control. But if you have inflation going at 8% a quarter or 8% a year, just remember how compounding works, right? Uh, it's not just that something that's $100 is now 108 and then the next year it's 116 It starts to compound and it starts to really hurt. And that means people have less to spend. And that means earnings go down. It's a really simple equation. So when I say the pros are worried, a lot of the pros are worried, but they still invest, right? They still end up taking long positions in stock they, stocks they like. They're just smaller positions and they're buy and holds or they're buying covers, like Mike said, trades that we rent, right? So we're still, you know, behind some of this buy, this buying us older guys because you might get a signal here or there. But yeah, they're worried. Whereas the younger generation of traders, professionals or otherwise, think that the Fed has to be there. Well, there has not been a situation really since 2000 where there's been inflation the Fed needed to contain. They've been preemptive on some of it. But remember, we're at the highest inflation levels since the 70s right now. So this, there's, they haven't had to control this. So it is really different this time, but not in a way that those guys are saying it's different this time. 
With our administration's prior priorities, our economic growth will be hobbled regardless of Fed policy. However, we must understand that commodity prices are going to cripple us unless controlled. And I'm not absolutely agree. And I'm not proposing that the government sets price controls. <laughs> <laughs> we do have those supposed shovel ready products in the uh, I'm sorry, projects in the infrastructure bill. We're still waiting on matching funds at the state level, um, but. You know, they're supposed to start and that could actually be a little bit of a boost for a slowing economy. But that's really not what you want. What commodity prices are part of the inflation story. So, I mean, it's all just. Again, older guy scared. Older guys, you know, when you live through it, it you have a different take on it. <laughs> I mean, it's like being in Florida, living through a hurricane versus watching it on the Weather Channel from like California. They're, they're very different aspects of the hurricane impression. So let's do a, uh, I'm going to do a pick a meme stock quote of the day. You keep talking, Mike. Let's see. Uh, again. Oh, boy, I'm just looking. Oh, by the way, crude, if you were looking for a super aggressive buy signal, it would be on a close above today's high. Uh, so that's, that's just something if you're looking for a, something, if you think this is the bottom of the move, that is a potential buy signal. Let's see. I just want to look at a couple other things. Gold spiking back below there and round rallying back very nicely. So nice, strong rally back with that silver. Also the same thing. Dipping in, by the way, those weren't double bottoms. They were just, uh, that's actually an ice cream grade thing I look at. Uh, we've already looked at, oh, I didn't show you notes. By the way, four hour notes did did trigger right here. Yep. And then remember, I draw the line between the candle bodies and the peak. We got the nice pull back into that and moving up. So not quite, to, not near the first target yet. But this is something that I will be watching play out for the next few days. But that is an official four-hour double bottom trigger on the notes. And I'm using conservative targets. Uh, what else? Did you, did you have something to say else, Bob? Meme stock quote for a Tuesday. Hey, Gary Gensler, are you going to comment on the blatantly obvious price manipulation from the highs today? So when, when AMC was going down, it was blatantly obvious price manipulation. You know, this, this, when your Reddit boards are lighting up last, uh, last on the 22nd, mysteriously once you have all this gamma juiced up and then you did, this isn't the manipulation. This is the manipulation. Mm -hmm. Are these, uh, I have nothing to say. I literally have nothing to say. I'm glad we have a, a smart audience and not because if you think this is price action manipulation from the highs, what about people taking something off the table after it's gone up like 50% in a day? It's uh, funny. They, um, you know, again, I don't, I don't actually mean to laugh because I'm sure these are all good people that are trading. Well, I shouldn't say that. I think the vast majority of them that are going to end up losing money on this are good people. But they don't look at this as just, you know, they're trading something. This is not the company as it currently stands is not really investable. They raised money and bought a gold mine company. That's not, you know, you would have liked to see AMC spruce up theaters and come out with a streaming service and maybe give it away for the first year for free or something to kind of move them in their core business to a, a more sustainable outlook. And instead they bought a gold miner. I mean, they're, they're trying to become a conglomerate that used to be a movie theater. This is very strange. This is very strange, but essentially when they're playing it for the short squeeze, they're being just as manipulative as anybody who is selling it down from the highs. And, and I feel bad for it. They, they have, it's, it's cultish in a way. Uh, let's see the halt down on AMC GME was scary today. <laughs> Not really? Uh, I mean, I'm Only scary if you're in it. Uh, let's see. Can we look briefly look at Baba? Sure. 
Sure. Uh, in sitting in consolidation, I'd only get it's still this line in the sand. That's your first warning shot from the 25th of March that a rollover. I'd also pay attention if it does rally more to make it could be a double top play in here. But below the 25th uh, low of 109.40. Against the rotation zone right now, but you clear that, you have a big gap fill, and I'd be watching for another longer term rollover play in here. There's nothing to this was a little bullish pop play off the prior resistance becoming support, and now it would be limited upside in my book and exposure to the downside. So there's nothing there that is uh that is very bullish for me at this point. The juniors would have a very different perspective if they could recall the the lines at gas stations forty plus years ago. In the seventies, the the gas issues I still remember that. Driving around, my dad had a uh, like a seventy Buick convertible. I mean, this thing was you want to talk about a boat? It must have got like four miles a gallon, and sitting in. <laughs> Going to fill that thing up in the in the in the seventies, that was whew. <laughs> yeah, four door Buick Electra. So I know what you're talking about. Seven nineteen seventy two. Man, I, get, Buick, I got Electra. seasick in that car. It was like I was sailing an ocean liner. Remember how many times you had to turn the wheel just to make a ninety degree turn? It would just keep going and going and going. Let's see, XOM. Mine had a seventy GTO waiting. 30 to 60 minutes to fill up a 70 goat. Yep. <laughs> uh, let's take a look at XOM. Uh, let's see. XOM looks good for a gap fill from the gap down today. Yeah, there's still some. Uh, let's see. Did it, Let's check our gap rules. It I, I guarantee closed above the 62 and a half. So that could, if the crew does rally. Look at that. Oh, that. I didn't look at XOM today, but. Double bottom play, wow! Look at that one. I should have. Somebody needs to text me this one. I missed this one. Look at that first the double. Then you watch for the close above the sixty-two and a half for the continuation play. The only thing I'd watch is if you get, execute that little double off the open tomorrow. If you're day trading it, you could get a better position on a pullback. Other than that, you still have the full gap play. Yep. Serves me right to look at uh, oil prices when you're looking at Exxon, not gas prices. Exxon uh, specifically uh, ver owns virtually no gas stations in the United States. Did I not States. say oil? You did, yeah. Just, oh, I, just a general comment. People will sit there and be like, the oil companies are squeezing us at the pump. They don't own gas stations. Well, Exxon, I've never filled up in an Exxon state. I mean, uh, yeah, they don't own them. They just they license out their name, and it's like mm -hmm. a one-time thing. That an Exxon station is not owned by Exxon. Yeah, I missed it, Sterling. I was sometimes it doesn't pop up for me, and I missed the comments. Thanks for putting it in there, though. That's why, again, those little great plays are any. Oh, play! Did anybody? I've been talking about this for so long, and then we finally broke out. Had the lines on the chart. 21.2370 to 21.37, right in the sweet spot for the long play on Russell. That was the play of the day from my perspective. Uh, anything else you wanted to say before we wrap this up, Bob? Nope, I'm good. So, hey, I will right. not be on next week, Tuesday. I'll be on this Thursday, but I will not be on next week, Tuesday. Well, which day are you going to sub in for that, Bob? Come on. Well, that was a lot to ask. Uh, Wednesday. How's that? <laughs> I'm just messing with you. Uh, all right. I can top on again another stream in about five to ten minutes if anybody else wants to cover some stocks, including uh, Tesla and everything else. So we will take a look at that. And I'll go over the S&P, NASDAQ, Dow, key levels I'm watching for the overnight session. Other than that, let's wrap this one up. Let's let Bob get on with his evening. And I'll see everybody who wants to rejoin the next one in a few minutes. Bye for now.